Okay, wow, so I had this whole thing prepared about how excited I am and how humbled I am to be here. And uh, all I can think about now was my friends telling me that I don't need a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> that I don't need notes, <laughs> that I should just speak freely, basically, and it will all be so natural. Well, here I am, 10 seconds into this talk, and I've already gone off script, so <laughs> thanks a lot for that advice. Anyways, I'm going to tell you a story about frustration, and it starts with my everyday life. And to understand that, I think it's, uh, it's important to know that my everyday life is pretty much as everybody else's. So I wake up, I take a shower, and I leave the house. Well, I put on clothes on before, but then I leave the house, I press play on my Spotify playlist, and maybe some of you recognize this as it's one of those endless playlists that go on and on if you don't stop them. So, at some point I wondered why I haven't heard any of the music or any of the artists I actually cared about for a long time. And the answer to that, and to there should be a giant drum roll here, as this is the dramatic epiphany of it all, was that I didn't pay any attention to what the algorithm selected for me in the first place. So it was at this point that I became actually aware of how I was living my daily life and, <laughs> and how, how my reality was created by not only Spotify, but by all of these algorithms. So I went home and I made a list to actually understand my recommended reality, if you will. So I would urge all of you to stand up real quick for just one tiny thing. It's the only exercise you have to do all night, so thanks a lot. <laughs> if I name any of service or app you have used in the past week, please feel free to sit down. So my list, from my personal list, it goes as follows. Spotify, Netflix, Amazon, Google, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was rather quick. Thank you very much. I don't feel that alone anymore <laughs> in this now. So, um, I've, yeah. So, the researcher and me really wanted to know how these algorithms work, as apparently we're all sort of uh, uh, impacted by them. So, there are many, many different recommender systems. That's the scientific terms. They have conferences about it. It's super nice. You can go whenever you want. So, if you don't go to these conferences, I'm just going to explain one specific type of algorithm. They're called content-based recommendation systems. And what they do is pretty simple. Um, you listen to a song, say on Spotify, say you listen to a hip-hop song, and the algorithm will select, well, the next best thing, which is another hip-hop song. So, it is quite crucial to understand that for all of these companies, and I'm talking Netflix, Amazon, Google, all of these companies, it is very important that these recommender systems do the best they can to recommend these systems as they push new content, they push niche content, they make your user experience better, and they lock you into their platforms. So, to that extent that at some point Netflix had a competition with the prize money of about $1 million for the programming team who could make an algorithm only slightly better. So, after having understood how they work, I felt so, so manipulated. How could it be that I was living my life without even knowing how much I've been manipulated? And I told my dad about this talk, and well, he was like, well, that sounds just like the relationship with your mother. So, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, sorry, they're divorced, it's fine. Um, uh, <laughs> and um, my consequent question became if I could trick these algorithms back into thinking I was, you know, somebody else and into back manipulating them, if you will. And when my dad chimed in and he was like, well, if it's anything like your mother, then probably no. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, I tried anyways, and I conducted an experiment, and the premise of it was quite simple. I was trying to be somebody else for an entire month, at least online. So, when I was doing that, I needed an online persona, and I already told you about my dad, so I took his identity. So, you need to understand a little bit about my dad before I can continue. So, he's 70 years old, he's single still, so, right? Um, <laughs> 
And he loves classical music, he loves documentaries, uh, he loves golf. He wears pretty classy, so he wears these golf pants and Ralph Lauren sweatshirt, so yeah, it's the whole package. So basically, <laughs> I'm not trying to advertise it really, um, but <laughs> basically what happened uh, was that I started with the basics. So I went on and created a Spotify profile and a Netflix profile, and the results were quite as expected. You listen to only classical music on Spotify, and what happens, you get only classical music by Spotify. The same goes for Netflix. You watch only documentaries on Netflix, and what happens is that apparently the whole platform all of a sudden consists of documentaries and true crime series. So, having learned that, and what I've learned about myself during all this, besides why bees are so, so very important for our environment, is that I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I actually enjoy watching documentaries, um, which I didn't as much before. Essentially, these algorithms still, they have a giant flaw, which is if you don't listen to the thing it expects you to, but do something out of the ordinary, things can get weird. So maybe some of you have been in the situation where you've been at somebody's house and you were invited to be the DJ for the night and um, the next day you wake up, maybe slightly hungover, and um, you have only Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears in your playlist. So um, yeah, that was a very good night. I'm not ashamed. There's some of you in the audience who know, <laughs> so <laughs> it was pretty cool. Um, so I think that's something that these algorithms really need to work on. So I had the music, I had the documentaries. I went on online shopping. As I told him, my dad, you know, he likes to dress very classy, so he wears his golf pants and the whole thing. So I went on and, you know, I googled trousers. So I went to an online shop, I bought some trousers, and actually the recommendation of the algorithm was to buy an entire outfit. So I was like, hey, this all kind of matches, so I can get just the entire outfit. Perfect. So. When I came back to the site, the algorithm started to recommend brands that my dad actually wears. So I was actually a little bit intimidated and a little creeped out, to be honest. So, and it was at this point at the experiment that it was particularly clear to me how much of a drawer these algorithms put us in. A drawer, right? Clothing store? No? Okay. So basically, what happened was that you're in this drawer and you end up buying the same sweatshirt for the rest of your life. My dad managed to do that without any alcohol recommendation <laughs> algorithm, but <laughs> that is an entire other story. So, to recap, I had the clothes, I had the uh, playlist, I had the Netflix account. I went on to a recipe site. Now, my dad has a very, very basic diet. So, he likes pasta and he likes meat. So. If these are the criteria you work with on these sites, you don't get a lot out of them. So <laughs> you enter pasta, and well, you get a lot of pasta recipes, and all the recommended recipes are also pasta. So I was like, okay, for the sake of this experiment, I can have a very, very unhealthy diet for about a month. Okay, fine. So I did that, and I ate pasta and meat for an entire month. And uh, not only did I gain weight, but I also started to get sick. So please let that sink in for a moment as a system or an algorithm that is actually badly designed will actually be bad for your physical health. And I had to take some vitamin pills after, actually, to get my immune system back on track. I don't know how my dad does it, to be honest. And further, um, I was a little bit surprised that all these pasta recommendation recipe sites do not recommend a good weight loss program. I mean, they know you only eat pasta, so please, <laughs> please, <laughs> at some point, please try to incorporate that. I want to... So, I had the diet, I had the pasta, I had the clothes, I had the music, I had the documentaries. I went on to Facebook. Now, the case with Facebook was interesting, as in, I entered all my dad's profile account, so I set up a fake profile. Uh, he's 70 years old, he's single, he has an interest in histories and documentaries and golf, all that. And the first thing that happened was that I got a lot of porn. So, <laughs> yeah. so it was um, older 
women want to sleep with me, younger women want to sleep with me. Apparently, there is a fair share of strip clubs that are targeted at older men in Bavaria, which I didn't know or wasn't aware of. And there were also more decent groups like, say, Munich Singles Over 40. And although I would love to join one of their many, many activities, for example, bike riding in the park, I mean, they would have known that, you know, I'm not over 40. And so the first category my dad was put in, apparently, or my fake online dad profile was put in, was that he is a little pervy. Cool. So the, se the second thing that happened was, and I don't know where Facebook got that from, was that my dad is also a little bit right-wing. So apparently um, the amount of national propaganda I got during this experiment was insane. I was prompted during that month to join over, say, 50 Nazi group, more or less. Um, and I was so creeped out after that that I had to quit Facebook for a while myself. For the last part of this experiment, I went on and created a Tinder profile. For you who don't know, it's an online dating platform. So um, I kept my original age and my original profile, and I altered the date, uh, date range I was searching in, uh, the age range I was searching in. So I think it was about 48 plus, like, you know, a woman my dad would date. So first outcome, older women in Munich not too interested in younger guys. Second outcome, the ones who were interested in younger guys, there was often a sexual intent to it, to be honest, uh, which is a, not a TED talk. And um, the last group was um, women who were actually interested in getting to know me, which was pretty cool. Before you judge me too much, I explained to them beforehand that this was out of the sake of getting out of my bubble, out of my usual comfort zone. So it was all, you know, consented, which was good. And I want to talk about one date in particular, and um, she was 51, and we bonded over a techno concert we went to a while ago in Munich, which is, was a great starting point for all of this. It was pouring rain, we were both there. It was pretty cool, and we realized we were both there. So we had this amazing connection, and we met, and we met at a bar at some point um, to drink something. And something very endearing happened in that very first moment as she took out her reading glasses because the light was a little dim. And then we started to talk about the latest CDs she just bought, her 21-year-old son, and politics. And it was just an amazing talk that contributed to something that I never had before. And it was at that moment that I realized how much of an offline bubble I actually live in. As I don't have these kind of talks or these kind of topics with my normal friends, right? And I'm glad to say that we still <laughs> meet up from time to time and actually became friends. So that's pretty cool. So lastly, there were some other things I did with this identity. However, due to time constraints, I'm not able to talk about all of them. So I want to walk you through my personal conclusions for this experiment. The first one is, I really like my comfort zone. I really like the bubble I live in. It's, I mean, it's a recommended reality for a reason, right? It's super nice. You get the music, you get the Netflix, you get all of it. It's awesome. The second one is, we as humans are a lot more diverse than these algorithms make us out to be. And it arises the question of who at this point is responsible for this development? Is it companies? Is it the programmers? Is it ourselves? Is it institutions? Is it governments? These are questions that need to be addressed at some point because we get influenced a lot, <laughs> to be honest. The third one being, this all will get worse as these systems get better. So, we will see an increase in these kind of things. We will see an increase in recommendations. And there are potential dangers to it, because maybe at some points these algorithms not only give you recommendations, but make actual decisions for you, i.e. where you can work, where you can live, where you can travel to. Finally, there is a silver lining to all of this, and I can give you a recommendation myself. Please try to do something different with your online identity. Try to listen to other music. Try joining 
weird online groups, try to get out of that comfort zone and see what you can take back into that comfort zone. I want to close this with one final thought. And that is, how are we, as humans, as a society, will cope with this over the time? How are we going to identify in front of machines? And how we will opt in or will opt out of this? And I think opting out is something key here, because there's a version of you without these algorithms and without all of these services. So please try to remember this version. Thank you very much. <laughs>